Thanks, buddy. There we go. Let's see. Let's see how that works. Not bad, not bad. Thank you for listening to the Bad Blonde Radio Show. I think we're good here. Let's see. Not bad. You are back listening to the Bad Blonde Radio Show on News Talk KEYS, 1440 AM and 98.7 FM, Corpus Christi, Texas. And today is a very, very good day. Yeah, the sun, it's actually, it's glorious outside. It's a Saturday. I don't have to work. Oh, it's going to be so nice. Chad, why is it a good day for you? It's, it's really hot still. No, it's actually not even that bad right now. I think I almost died yesterday. You sh uh, were you drinking water? I was. Were you hungover from uh, Outrageous? Because I was. I may have been, but it was just really hot. Yeah. I got the, the heat exhaustion. Did you really? Yeah, I did. Oh, got all be careful, buddy. Start seeing devils and dragons. I was on LSD also. Oh, okay. <laughs> I remember this is 1440 keys. <laughs> no, I, yeah. I, I did get a, I think I just worked too hard. It was really hot. Yeah. Started getting all lightheaded. I was like, oh man. So, yeah. So, get some cool air for a little bit. For yeah. folks listening, yeah. Chad does work in an unair conditioned uh, mechanic shop, which it does get freaking hot there. You know what I mean? It really does. It is. It can get hot, and then uh, sometimes you got to work on a hot car that comes in. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. You know, that's a good point. Engine is just radiating heat out onto you. It really does. So, yeah, I gotta be careful. I spent a lot of summers in our mechanic shop, and I can vouch for it that uh, there's been a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. That's for sure. A lot more sweat than the tears and the blood. <laughs> well, let's recap a little bit of how awesome Outrageous was, guys. If you uh, are, didn't he check out the last show, I had a uh, chair of Outrageous, Deanne Bouquet, and Amanda Horn, who works does all your uh, the events at the art museum on the show last Saturday talking all about outrageous heels and wheels. It was great. We had a car show. There was a fashion show. There was a drag show. They, it was pretty impressive. And then also headlining was Jackie Vinson. Chad, what did you think about Jackie Vinson's performance? Good. Really cool. Right? We, we got to see her twice too. It was really cool. Yeah, we did. We checked out the, uh, she has some, uh, really cool songs. Awesome guitar player. Very oh. unique, too. Yeah, right? Uh, great band. And it was a lot of fun. I hadn't seen her before, just online. So we went there, and then uh, afterwards, we went to the exchange. Checked her out. Like an after-show uh, performance. Yeah, and it was real personal. It, it you was. You're basically right at the stage. So yeah. That was pretty cool. I think she's going to be going places. So. Oh, yeah. Should have won sure. that signed guitar or whatever. I know. Well, I was hoping for it. I was hoping for it. Well, today is a great day for me because, like I already said, today it's been a long week of work, and I'm so happy it's Saturday. I slept in till like 7:30, and it felt really, really good. And also, why it's a good day is we are going to be talking all about the history 
of Triumph Motor Car uh, Motor Company, and mostly we'll be covering the TR series. I'm gonna jump a little bit into the Spitfire, but um, it's a beloved British sports car, and I can't wait to talk about it. People are gonna. It's really interesting too. Chad, do you want to keep texting on? Who are you texting on your cell phone? Is it Chris? Chris, you can just text any questions you might have at 882-5397. Chad wasn't going to give you the text line. <laughs> there but is a read on Chris, whatever you want to say, I will say online. I will say on air. Whatever you want. If it, if it, yeah, just don't include one of the seven bad words I'm not allowed to say on air. The message I sent is do not text in. They will block you. Uh, I won't block you. I have, I have the power over the text line, guys. I have it up. <clears throat> it's live if anybody has any questions or also if you want to tell me what your favorite of the TR series text it on triumph. in yeah triumph TR series well should we dive in chat I do wait 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 before I do want to say a big thank you to the owners that took their cars to the car show at Heels and Wheels Outrageous really appreciate it it added a lot to the entire experience and i know there were a lot of people out there taking photos by their cars it was pretty nice yeah it was cool i i, I enjoyed it outdoors right I thought it was pretty neat and i that might be their highest attendance you know and i guess they sell out for when they have indoors do they have bands when it's indoors too yeah yeah all right i just think the outdoors is a lot more fun it I was know. it added a lot to it it really did it's like being at acf yeah, yeah. Which without it, the weed smell, uh, I don't mind that. But um, at AC, they've already they put out the a, the current ACL lineup, and I am pretty tempted by it. Did you see it? No, it got so expensive. I remember when you lived up there, we were going. It's like 150 bucks it, for three days. It something. wasn't bad, yeah. And it yeah. also wasn't so they didn't. It this was before it got it was massively insane. popular. Yeah. Now they're doing it like two weekends. They have to, yeah. And uh, it just seems like it's gotten too commercialized, I guess. I don't know. Well, every, yeah, Austin, most definitely. And what are tickets for a three day pass now? I don't even know. I have no idea. I didn't even look. Apparently, they all sold out before I even. I'm so late on the game that they all sold out before I even knew the lineup was out. <laughs> oh, well, oh, well. All right. Shall we start? Shall we start talking about the history of Triumph Motor Cars? But I need a little more enthusiasm out of that. Let's do it. Yeah, let's just go ahead and jump right in. All right, guys. So what's interesting, and also this is not unique to Triumph, but they did not start off as making cars. All right. Many automotive manufacturers did not begin by making cars. They just kind of wound up there. Triumph started off by uh, this clever German guy, Siegfried Bettmann. All right. He was importing stuff into London, England and putting his name on it. And I'm talking stuff like bicycles, sewing machines, etc. He was putting his name on there and selling them. And then Siegfried would get uh, get acquainted with a guy named Moritz Schott, and their partnership would be what started what basically that was the first domino to what Triumph would be because Moritz convinced Siegfried to use his Triumph name and create his own bicycles. And bicycles lead to motorcycles, and motorcycles sometimes lead to cars. And that's really how it happened. So another, like, there, I, I can't tell you how many other automotive manufacturers started off by making sewing machines. Heck, uh, Pierce and Arrow were making Victorian bird cages, wire bird cages, before they dipped into automotives and became one of the most, the, the leading uh, American luxury vehicle company. Isn't that funny? I think back in the time, in that time, uh, if you had the machinery to manufacture or whatever, yeah, and the automobile was not as sophisticated or anything as it is now. That it was you had heads up, and the the market was just you know just starting out. So you're like, well, I, I, I yeah, can do I can make this? I have a machinery to do that, and why don't I make a little car? Yeah, that's it, what I think a lot of them did. You know, and it, it, like you said, also the the market was more accessible. Like you could actually, now you have to be Elon Musk who was born into money and also yeah, back, had the ability. Back then you did whatever you wanted. Yeah, You're exactly. Like, I'm going to make a car. Here's my car. Yeah. Now you have to go through the government, the NHTSA or whatever yeah. and crash, crash like 300 cars into a wall or yeah. people. 
into a dummy that's walking across the street. So it's not like, it's unless not you do same. it as a kit car, I think it's really difficult to manufacture a vehicle. It really is. It really is. That's why I stopped doing the Chad car. <laughs> There's no such thing. <laughs> All right, guys, let's go ahead. We're going to fast forward to post World War II. All right. When the government and uh, and Britain was saying, "Hey guys, to all their automotive manufacturers, actually just not not even just the automotive manufacturers, all their manufacturers, they were saying, export or die. All right, um, economic times were not great. Just about they weren't great anywhere in the world except for the U.S. We really after each World War, nothing really happened on our." our land and territory so we we were always set we were ready we were ready to buy things um so they started triumph started with the triumph roadster that came out in 1946 it had a top speed of 75 miles per hour and just to uh kind of frame the time period mg was nailing it with their t-types and the xk120 was our was was coming out in 1948 all right now the xk120 went it's, it, it was the fastest production car of its time, and it was going 120 miles per hour. So 75 versus 120. Now, after the Roadster, they made a serious design leap to the Triumph TRX concept. And that was a super flop. Did you see what that looked like, Chad? Is like a bubble. It was so unattractive. Like it, I, mean, it, I didn't. But... It looked like something you'd put the Jetsons in, like a bubbly Jetson car, as opposed to any kind of like... It was but not attractive. Before um, 1946 uh, and the war, interestingly enough, uh, in 37, Donald Healy actually designed Triumph's first engines. Tell us more. A Healy fan. Yeah. And uh, in 36, he made a straight eight motor that was kind of a copy of an Alfa Romeo. But straight eight, I mean, that's a long... Motor. It, a lot of, it really is. Of length. And that, that that motor and that car that he made was the Triumph Dolomite, which came back later. Dolomite. That's the coolest name ever. It really is. I don't even know what that is. It sounds like that stuff that the Australians put on their, uh, their I think sandwiches. That's Vegemite. Or yeah, the Vegemite sandwich. But anyway, he made that engine and uh, it never made it into the production car, but that's kind of. English car history is always interesting because they're all kind of tied together a lot. Oh, yeah. no, it, The Healy's and the Jensen's and the... the, 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 the Everybody's slightly, it, it, I don't want to say incestuous, but yes. Yeah, no, always, there's there's definitely some in between. Uh, and actually, interesting lot of Triumph's thing, their, their actual plant when they were during the war was, as many we've talked about, was completely bombed out in yeah. 1940s. Yeah, seriously. Total there's... rebuild. They were uh, Mini Cooper. Who else? Oh, we were. I feel like we were just talking about. Most of England. Yeah, yeah. The what was that? The Blitzkrieg. And uh, the Blitzkrieg was Blitzkrieg? the bombing of England. It was yeah. The charging of Europe, but England no, was, no, no, a there was a island. There was a big bombing that went on in in the Coventry area. That that's when they knocked out a lot of the car the car manufacturers. Yeah. Who were probably making tanks. And Oh, for there. sure. I mean, probably good. Anyways, I looked up dolomite, and I, what I thought, because it sounds a lot like muscovite or biotite, which are like part minerals, basically, like that you find in your granite. Uh, it is a, a mineral. It is uh, usually found in limestone. Dolomite. That's what it means. Uh, oh, and right Aiden's giving me the old wrap it up sign. All right, guys, we're going to take a little break, and then we're going to come back talking to you all about the history of Triumph and their TR series. It's so hot in here. Okay, that break that went really fast, right? I didn't. I haven't gotten a single text message from Chris. I may have given the wrong number. I said it all. Is he not listening? Do you need this? For your microphones. Nobody was in here. Okay, good point. Let's look. That I mean, honestly, that fifteen minutes went so fast. Forty-five minutes. 
What did uh what did Chris want to say? Try something like it. Okay, I love reading like the text message line. So that's probably Chris. No no no, this is this is this is somebody else. Sure. It's to Bob. It's Bob Jones. To Bob? Mm hmm It's uh, somebody on here says, No one cares about an aging, straight, white man. They say we are not needed and to blame for everything. And you know why I am the way I am. That's the way I feel that I go on. Senile and angry. And then I assume it's Bob says, Enjoy your weekend. <laughs> He said, I need to know I'm needed. Is that so wrong to you? And then Bob says, not at all. I just don't think that you should allow other people to control your mood or outlook. <laughs> what else is on here? <laughs> uh, ooh. This is so fun. So much drama. I'm kind of happy we don't get a lot of... My name's Jeff. I love the bad blonde. And that goofy guy that sits next to her and makes funny noises. I think he's related to her, but I don't know. Can you talk more about the little known auto manufacturers from the early 40s, Squirmy and Grubs? What is Chris's... Okay. <laughs> you don't need to indulge him. All right. Hello, hello, my friends. You are back listening to the Bad Blonde Radio Show on News Talk KEYS, 1440 AM and 98.7 FM, Corpus Christi, Texas. Bam. And if you'd like to text in a question or a comment, you can do that at 361-882-5317. Yes. And we have a comment from George. George is very excited about our topic, the Triumph and their sports cars, because George, George owns a TR4. And the nice. TR, we're going to get to that in a bit, but the TR4 is when Triumph Motor Company made their big design leap. And be They remind me of a bug eye spray. No. The TR4s? No. Or am I thinking You're about thinking the about the TR3. Okay. You're 100% right. But that's right after the TR3 is when they went, um, it was uh, Michelodi. Why can't I think his name? I can't ever say his name. Michelodian? No, no. I always have a hard time saying some of these Italian designer names. Um, but he did it. It's Giovanni Michelodi. And uh, that's when we're get, already getting ahead of ourselves. But thank you, George. I love that text message. And if anybody else has any kind of questions or comments or you've got a triumph and you want to tell us about it, go ahead and text us at 882-5397. Yeah. All right. Where were we? Hey, Aiden, I think I can still hear the music and you know I can't double. I can't. I cannot multitask. Is it there? Maybe I just hear... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're good. We're good. Yeah, it was a TR3. The TR3 and the Buckeye yeah. Sprite look, uh, which was oh, Healy. Oh, they look so similar. Which Healy was making triumphant. And like you were saying, they're all like, all the British people were all in everybody's cooking. Oh, 100%. 100%. Okay, let's get back. We've already, we're jumping around. Oh, which, sorry. All right, well, it's so easy to jump around and digress, frankly, for me at least. Let's go ahead. We're going to go back to the Triumph TRX concept. All right. This was like the right. It was after the Triumph Roadster. This is like the second domino. Um, it was such a flop. Like it. And it was so ugly, guys. If you are by a computer, Google Triumph TRX concept. It was so fugly. Uh, and the funny part is that it was only safe when a passenger was also in it to balance the weight. Like that's just not even good planning, you know? Are you good? No, Did it you keeps it exciting. <laughs> yeah, we're okay. It is. It's ugly. Uh, uh, yeah, it's ugly. It is ugly. And I'm also, I'm very good at finding beauty in cars, you know, or something that makes me be like, ooh, but that's just not a good looking car at all. Being able to compliment somebody on anything. 
Yeah, I can. I have that ability. <laughs> yeah. After this, after after they totally bombed with the Triumph TRX concept car, after this they went back to the parts bend and like jumbled around in there and they created the Triumph 20 TS. And they showed it at the 1952 Earl's Court Motor Show. It was kind of a messy little conflagration of uh, parts, but it would become known as the first Triumph TR1. The beginning of the TR series. Dun, dun, dun. Now the funny thing is, is that the TR1 was test drove by Ken Richardson. He called it a low-powered death trap. That's not the best review you could get, <laughs> but it's not the worst review. What is the worst review? Uh, that's a second best review would be high powered death trap. Didn't we have other one that was called like the heat death or what were we talking about? Oh, the the death co the hot coffin or something. <laughs> and that was the beginning of uh this that was a that was a Nissan that was like the 410 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't yeah. want that to be your first death. We should do a radio like a 15 minute segment on the worst reviews of cars. And because that's that would be pretty high up on there. He actually said, Ken Richardson said it was the worst car he had ever driven. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's personal opinion. <laughs> that's personal opinion. <laughs> so, what they did is uh, obviously Triumph went back to the drawing board and they decided they had to tune the engine, increasing the speed to over 100 miles per hour. They increased the brake size, they stiffened the chassis, they modified the suspension, and boom, they had the Triumph. TR2. And it was a hit. People love the TR2. And it does look like the, the TR2, the TR1 and the TR2 and the TR3 look a lot like the Healy, for sure. Do we have a, do we have, is it the TR3 we have in the shop or a TR2? I don't remember. We have a two. Okay. Yeah. Also, cool. uh, what was that guy's name? The editor or whatever? What do you mean? The guy who wrote the review. Oh no, that was a that was a test driver, yeah. Ken Richardson. Like, also, after Triumph did the TR two or which the one you were talking about, yeah, they also went up and beat up Ken Richardson. No, they didn't. Yes, they did. <laughs> I don't think so. That was a Shalaga, which is an Irish fighting game. Are you being serious? Yeah, a Shalaga. I think you're. I feel like you're. I'm not even kidding. I think Lepre this is a fib fest. I'm serious. That's what leprechauns carry, and that's how the Irish used to fight a lot with wooden fighting sticks. Anyway, back to Triumph. <laughs> I can't, I like, I'm dead I serious. cannot, I cannot with you, Chadwick. <laughs> you sure can. I think this is a lie. If that, if that is the case, that would be funny and that would be like right up with the Dodge Brothers beating up a lawyer outside of a oh, saloon. I was kidding about Triumph. I wasn't kidding about the Shalala or whatever you pronounce it. Well, you learn something new every day. Anyways, the TR2 was a hit, all right? They fixed things up, smarter of them. Uh, the TR2 was one of the first cars to produce a hardtop option of fiberglass, which was quite futuristic for the time. It's also cool because you could roll with your convertible top and then you put the hardtop in it. It's kind of like a whole new design. It really it changes is. the car, so. It 100% does. It's like a MG uh, A's and stuff all had that, and it was kind of cool because it really did make the car look totally different. So oh. you had two different cars, basically. And that is fun. Yeah. That and it's fun. not way cheaper than buying a, a different car. Yeah. And interestingly, the, so the TR2 did have some initial problems with road holding, but it was fixed by implementing larger rear brakes and the addition of radial tires, which at the time, radial tires were like a brand new development coming out of Michelin. Yeah. But they changed that. And how nice, yeah, how nice is that that they, they were like, oh, okay, well, these are some easy fixes. The TR2 did pretty well in racing and Triumph really used this greatly to their advantage in PR and advertising. Now, in 1955, they came out with the TR3. Dun, dun, dun. Very, very inventive with their naming of these. Ever, oh, I know, well, MGT, MGD, MG, you know what I mean? All that, like, nobody really, XK140, XK120. The XK120 was named because it went 120 miles per hour. The Austin Healey 3000 was because it was uh, the CC. Like, it, it's funny how there there was never that much inventiveness 
And also well, the, the Nissan Z. Um, Even BMW still follows the yeah, right? and others. So. Exactly. No, but, and you know what? Maybe we don't want them to get creative. Like the creating new cool names. Cool names would be cool for cars. We don't need them to take the, like the the Olive Garden Olive Garden initiative and in naming their things like brand like making up words to name their cars or anything. That's cool. Right, these kind of going away. Are they? Are they? Yeah, I guess. Like the Telluride. Yeah. <laughs> Santa Fe. Hyundai is like a, a crush on New Mexico. That's adorable. And you're right. They do. All right. So with the TR3, when they released it, um, they needed to continue. Why they did. Is it? How? How is it that this uh, 15 minutes goes so fast? Aiden's playing with the time. I know. Aiden, are you, are you warping? Are you speeding through time? Are you warping this? I will get back in there and I will tickle you, sir. Just kidding. Aiden had to get on the air earlier with Dotson, and I was tickling him the whole time. He handled it like a pro. All right, guys, y'all stay tuned to the Bad Blonde Radio Show. We are talking all about Triumph Motor Cars and their rocking British speedsters. I meant to say roadsters on there. Talking is hard. Um, I'm shocked at how uh, fast this 15 minutes is going. What's Chris saying now? <sighs> There's the weirdest text messages. <laughs> what up, bro? Oh, no, you're totally good. Don't let it happen again, Aiden. <laughs> I don't want to have to go in there. With my Shalalaga. Shalalaga. Look up Shalalaga. Dude, I guarantee you, pe the people that are listening are like, what is this guy on? It's, dude, look it up. It's yeah, authentic. Yeah, but does that have any, sh does it have anything to do with Triumph? If there no! were like battles on one, they would have used a, Shalali. Shalali. That's what it's pronounced. You're going to get a reputation as the co host that <laughs> is like entering senile. Look up Shalali. When you start talking about things that make no sense, you sound like Joe Biden. Dude, it's an Irish fighting. Yeah, the but Irish fighting state. What does that connect with, with Triumph, though? That is how they beat that guy reviewer up with. Is Shalali. it true that he got beaten with one of those? No. Yeah. Okay, well now you understand that that has absolutely no connection. History is, <laughs> history is made to me. Uh, literally, there are people that are listening are like, what the hell is going on? Like, even I over here was like, what is going on? A shalalagi. Shalali. God, Bob gets some like tough messages. <laughs> this Pippa Akareze. How do I create this contact? How do I add their name? Oh. Chris with a K or a C. <laughs> Don't make it work. Chris, Chris doesn't know that like every time he texts in, it's the same. Like it says, I put his name in, so it says, "Hi, this is Lindsay. I am a female. That Chad boy has a sexy voice and is very knowledgeable. Is he single? If he is, I can't understand why. Well, I have a few theories. I asked. I told him to send in something like that. <laughs> now read it on the air. All right. Hello, hello, my friends. We are back at the Bad Blonde Radio Show, News Talk, KEYS, 1440 AM and 98.7 FM, Corpus Christi, Texas. We're on every Saturday at 10 AM. Bright or shine or whatever. Bright or shine. <laughs> whatever that is. Cloudy or windy. I would like to thank Chris Munoz for sending in 
two very uh, colorful text messages. Chris, what you don't realize is that when you text, your phone number is entered and now your name is on there too. So um, when you texted and said, hi, this is Lindsay, I knew it was Chris. <laughs> I think that was Lindsay. Now, what did Lindsay have to say? Um, uh, we're not going to cover what Lindsay had to say. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to get back to talking about the Triumph Motor Company and their mainly their TR series. And we will talk a little bit about the Spitfire, you know, their sports cars. Okay, so back to the where we left off was we were talking about the TR3. All right. Now, why they came up, they had the TR1, the TR2. The TR2 is really when it started booming. Um, it was a hit. Consumers wanted it. They had fixed a lot of their problems. Um, now, why they needed to continue to update and release more roadsters? Well, they had really tough competition for sports cars. The 50s and 60s were rocking it. The Porsche had the 356. Jaguar had now uh, gone from the 120 to the 140. Sunbeam Alpine was out. MG had, uh, had their T-Series. The 50s and 60s were a darn good time to be alive. Yeah, good time for roadster vehicles, for sure. Also, obviously, less safety regulations. That's why we had so many fun cars. Now, the interesting thing about the TR3, it was the first British car to have front disc brakes as a standard option. Just standard, Them. actually, not even an option. Them do help. For sure. All right, right. And then Triumph would make a big, this is when we would make a big design leap. Now, if, you, if you're listening, but you can't quite picture what some of these cars look like, the TR1, the TR2, and the TR3 have more of like a sweeping look to it, okay? It looked like the, some of the early Heelys, the Sprite, right? Yeah. Yeah. It, and if, you should Google it. You should They're Google very, it. Very good looking cars. If you're, yeah, no, I like them. I, I do. Uh, kind of like, a, you know, and I can see where how they were probably like, they took a look at the XK120 and they were like, well, how can we make that half the size? You know what I mean? Um, so after the TR3, this is when Triumph would make a big design leap. All right. They would leap behind the curves of the early TRs. And with the uh, design of Giovanni Michelotti, they would lead them into the future with the TR4, all right? Now, Michelotti was a pretty darn prolific designer at the time. He had already done a handful of Ferraris, Maseratis, and uh, Lancia or Lancia. I always have a hard time pronouncing that. Now, right around the time of the TR4, Triumph was actually taken over by Leland Motors, and stupidly, Leland ceased any motorsport participation for Triumph. That's not, that is just not good business sense right there. Not cool, Leland. Yeah, it just wasn't, frankly, it wasn't clever because race on Sunday, buy on Monday. You know, you miss out on a whole lot of free advertising. Uh, you know, also research and development can often happen on the track. So I, that made no sense to me whatsoever. Yeah. Just people in charge that don't know anything. They just don't know some, they just don't know anything at the time. Now, like I said, like, so that was such a bit, it's, it was, it's, you know, a little, little, little boxy, little cube-esque, you know what I mean? Like it, it was a whole different design and really that would, the TR4 design would shape the future of the TR series after that. Right? Very influential. Well, yes, indeed, indeed. Now, um, at this point, let's break off a little bit and talk about the Spitfire. Shall we? How about that sports fan? Because the Spitfire has like a super interesting story. It almost didn't happen. All right. So like, well, let's paint a little picture of the times. The Standard Motor Company, who owned Triumph, had already been producing the TR series like we were talking about in the Herald. However, they had a price gap. All right. A, a lower and in between their lines that held an opportunity. All right. Basically, what they wanted to do was compete and chase down the sales of the Austin Healy Sprite. Yeah. I also had a cool name, which was named after World War II yeah. British fighter planes. So it, yeah. Cool name. It really is a cool name. So they decided it to... It is a cool name. It is Spit, a cool name. Spitfire. Arr. Yeah. They decided to use the Triumph Herald chassis and create a new sleek shell. And the, it had a code name, all right? It code name was The Bomb Project. Cool, right? Yeah, that is kind of cool. Bomb. The bomb project. This design project actually was put in the lap of Giovanni Michelotti, which is the same gentleman we just said designed the TR4. 
Um, he also did, you know, he also did the Herald, uh, the Triumph, the GT6, and the, T yeah, I already said the TR4. Now, aside from that, like I had already mentioned, Leyland had just bought the company. And at that time, like they were doing, you know, they, they kind of put a hold on a few things. They covered up the, the bomb project, AKA the Spitfire with a, with a sheet and kind of like got it lost in the corner of one of the warehouses during that whole, you know, exchanging, uh, you know, business exchange. And it almost wasn't a thing. And this is one of those British in interminglings again with Leyland. On the real. Who was British Leyland. It's, ex it's and exhausting to keep track. Manny and Austin and all this stuff. So they're all, like I said, everybody's in everybody's soup. You know, they're all trying to put like, ah, I need more tomatoes. Yeah. Always putting their weird ideas and always joining these different companies. Exactly. It's a small island over there. It, yeah, it, it really, it really is. That's for sure. Now, like I said, this the Spitfire almost wasn't a thing, except for like a curious employee happened upon this like car covered by a dusty sheet and was like, what is this? He lifted the sheet and there and behold it was a beautiful roadster. All right. So he found it, pushed it up in front of the right mines, and the Roadster was launched as the Spitfire IV at the London Motor Show in 1962. And production numbers hit about a little over 4,500. Um, and the Spitfire was, as Chad had already mentioned, the name was a nod to the iconic British single-seat fire uh, fighter aircraft from World War II. And the Spitfire was a tiny car. Dude, there I there are little bitty cars. I have yeah, so like I have um it, on my YouTube I have a drive video of of a Triumph Spitfire. Also have a few photos I, that I posted for the show today on uh, the Bad Blonde Facebook, and I look like I look like an Amazon when I Amazonian woman when I am standing by a Spitfire. They're fairly roomy once you're in them. You need to do some yoga. It was very difficult. It was a, it was pretty cool. You gotta car. do some stretches to get in there. Even how the hood the hood was a forward pivot hood, so yeah. open up from the glass up. Very interesting design. Very tiny little car. Dude, so Kinda tiny. Like the MG Midget. Yeah. Around the same size. Yeah. Now now there only there was a controversial aspect about the Spitfire. All right. It had a shifty back end that could cause some pretty serious oversteer. When driven too hard. Yeah. Now, they did fix it eventually. But a lot of people knew. Yeah, it was, it was a problem. A lot of those cars back in the day, I don't know if I'd really... I mean, back then, I guess you didn't have a choice or uh, the information or anything out there, but... A lot of them didn't handle that great. I was going to say, there were no forums to be like, hey, yeah, well, heads like, up. My, my 2008 C4 handles really much better. But yeah. A lot of them, yeah, the technology just wasn't there. Mm -mm. They didn't handle that good. No, but it would be fixed. It would be fixed. Mm -hmm. Now, at this point, and this was also very true for a majority of British exports, or heck, German exports, you name it. 75% of the Spitfire production left the UK. 45 of the sales were coming to the USA. You know, and I think at this time also, the Austin Healy 3000 was exporting like 80%. Yeah. It, it, we're, America buys. We buy, you know, we buy exceptionally. We were doing pretty good after World War II. Yeah. But better probably than Europe. And... Well, we didn't have any of our manufacturing plants bombed and I, that played yeah. a big role. And we also weren't in the war as long. We kind of tried to no, we were kind hold of booming. off. We were kind of booming afterwards, and the English probably didn't have that much money, yeah. the population-wise, so they were selling us their cars. Probably didn't want to sell it to Germany. <laughs> probably didn't want to sell them to Russia. So <laughs> the only market, really, was North America. Yeah, yeah. All right, so in 1968, Triumph's main competitor, BMW, with the MGB and the and the MG Midget would find themselves all under the same roof with British Leyland. There's a theme of the Brits eating themselves here with this on, on their uh, on their their sports cars. Yeah, it's really interesting when you see it and you go into the history of Austin Healey, Austin Jensen, blah blah blah. They're always like combining yeah. with each other and whatever. But like the Eastern Europe. Uh, 
they always have been like yeah. combining and battling each other. Yeah. It's a tiny little place, kind of. You can imagine, though, this was not a good moment in the sports car world to have all of these folks under British Leyland. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And this eventually would, uh, this, I'm getting ahead of myself on that one. So we talked about the Spitfire. Let's go back to, let's go back to the TR5, which came out in 1967. Which, and it was powered with a six cylinder. It had fuel injection, which was not the norm at the time. I don't think it was very good fuel injection. Probably not. <laughs> and then. I think they called it PI, petrol, petrol injection. They may have. Then there was also the TR250. And now the TR6. Yes. It's 1969 and the release of the TR6. And it had all new styling by Carmen, which was, uh, it was out of, Carmen's out of Germany, right? Design house out of Germany, which would be, you know, Carmen Ghia and stuff. Yes. Yeah. All new front end and, and rear. And now I'm going to be honest. So I have a very special fondness for the TR6. When we were a kid, there was a regular in our mechanic shop that had, it was a maroon, uh, with maroon, like plum color, and it had a Union Jack right on the hood. Do you remember that car, Chad? Yeah. Pretty awesome. I love that. Like, that was the coolest thing in the world to me. So the TR6 were built from 1968 to 1976, and it was the best seller of the TR range until the TR7. The TR7 looks cool, but it's just a very... It, they, don't, they don't do nothing for me. <laughs> they, it's very... TR6 is cool. Everything under the 5, TR6 to TR1, cool. TR7 looks like an 80s Toyota Celica or something. Yeah. There was a good quote, and I'm trying to remember who it was, and I almost feel like it was uh, Giovanni Michelotti. I think, I think he said, they're crap. I know. Huh? No, he made that up, but he, it was a funnier quote. He, he looked, it was looking at the front, and he went around to the back, and he said something like, by God, they did it to the back, too! <laughs> you know, because, like, it just looks like, yeah, I don't know. It's not bad. I mean, I, I think it's cool. And uh, I suffer from a, the ability to, to find just about anything cool or unique, so too bad. But it's funny because, like, the TR7 outsold the TR6, and just like it's clearly, ha just like Chad, like, it's clearly has a polarizing design, you know? It outsold them, but I'm sure it, it has no that has much lesser to do. value than the TR6. Oh, yeah. TR6s were good looking cars. They TR7 are. was. Kind of at that period with weird bumpers you had the crash bumpers and the engine was underpowered yeah. uh i think they were trying to be real futuristic innovative and I, it just didn't work mm-hmm mm -hmm. it did not it's just not a good looking car <laughs> let's be honest it looks like a weird 914 smashed into an 80s Toyota yeah, Celica. Or yeah, that's that nails. That's pretty much the nail in the nail on the head for sure. And it was like an underpowered engine. There was just nothing really going for it. No, 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 not at all. And unfortunately, so now, like with the, after the TR7. And if you have a TR7 and you like it <laughs> smashing on your car, make sure to text in at 882 <laughs> and we'll apologize to you. Well, that's just the thing is, uh, you know, everybody's got an opinion. And as long as you like what you're driving, then who really cares, yeah. right? And it's still a cool car, and you won't see many of them because yeah. they're all broke. <laughs> <laughs> but they are still cool. I mean, it's a it's a classic car, and, and there they aren't that many of them out there. So, I mean, it's still cool. It's still cool. All right, Aiden's giving me the old wrap it up signal. We will be back on the Bad Blonde Radio Show talking about the history of Triumph Motor Company. Boop, boop, doo! Uh, did Lindsay say anything? Lindsay Girl said, Hi, this is Lindsay. I am a female. In parentheses. That Chad boy has a sexy voice and is very knowledgeable. Is he single? If he is, I can't understand why. 
Well, I have a few theories. Y'all are ridiculous. He's like, send me the number I'm going to take so it's like, don't even text me. I just like it. It's like, that's what it looks like. I have a few. Like it, I can see it's the same person. You know what I mean? I love it, the British, British. Mom. Designed the TR7. It'd be really funny if Michelodi did. No. A guy named Harris Mann. It's weird. He's a British co cool designer. I bet all his cars look the same. Nope, that's pretty much all he did. Did, I didn't know the MG had a Z series. Oh, they didn't make it over to the States, that's why. Oh, when I, when, when I went to England, they had new MGs. Yeah. I, they, I, they may still be manufacturing. I don't know, but probably talk about that. They're, they're still making, MG's still making crap. All right. Hello, my friends. You are back listening to the Bad Blonde Radio Show on News Talk KEYS, 1440 AM and 98.7 FM, Corpus Christi, Texas. And it's been a lot of fun. I feel like this last, what, 30 minutes, 45 minutes has gone so fast. We're talking about the Triumph Motor Company, who has had quite an interesting past and present. And let me tell you about it. If you're just now tuning in, now, Triumph Motor Company all started with two gentlemen who were importing bicycles and sewing machines, putting their names on it, and selling it to rich Londoners. They would eventually go on to officially establishing Triumph by creating their own bicycles and selling them, and then creating their own motorcycles and selling them, and then their cars, all right? And uh, post-World War II, they, would, they just were trying to create a sports car that they could import to the States because the States, we were buying stuff. And then you would see the TR1, the TR2, the TR3, the TR4, TR6. And then we just stopped by talking about the TR7, which as Chad was saying, is not very attractive. It wasn't their best work. I don't think so. And it was it was a leap, I would say. It was a great leap from the, the TR six and the TR four. And it was it was at that time period also where you started getting crash standards, government yeah, crash bumpers. standards and everything. So maybe that played a role in it. It's unfortunate, but I think it did. It ain't no TR six and it ain't no TR four. No, those are beloved, that's for sure. Now, I did also, at some point, I, I broke off from the TR series, and I talked a little bit about the Spitfire, because it has such a cool story. You know, the Spitfire almost wasn't a thing. They had started working on it. They called it the Bomb Project, and when uh, Triumph was purchased by British Leyland, well, kind of got lost in a sea of factories with a sheet on top of it until a curious employee came along, took off the sheet, said, ooh, that is a good looking roadster. And then boom, that's how we ended up with it. How do you make a car and you put it in the closet somewhere? Forget about and you it. Find it later, like, oh wow, whoa, I had this car. I have here. I have absolutely no idea. But that's what happened. That's what happened. So um uh, one thing I do wanna you know, they had what what how many years was the tw the T R series was that twenty eight years of production? I'm green. Because <laughs> I have no idea. I know, I know, I knew that you were like, uh, her. Um, so why? Why we don't have any Triumph cars today? Well, 
like we already kind of we've been hitting on it slightly as uh british manufacturers like to intermingle and then get purchased up and then british british leyland um i think did they stop i think they stopped they also owned mg which uh they stopped both mg they stopped mg and started focusing on triumph and then they would stop triumph in the 80s is yeah. that it i believe so and actually not cool well they didn't do the best i think mg is still around i think it's now owned by an indian company which is funny because the uh, european or, or british colonization the empire yeah. yeah of ruling you know india and all those places it's kind of got a full circle where a lot of indian motor companies are owning rover and all these british manufacturers that and is that is a hilarious although, cycle right there. Apparently BMW still owns they BMW purchased Rover yeah. and Triumph came in the package. And uh BMW ended up selling Rover to Tata, which is an Indian company. Yeah. But they they wouldn't sell Triumph. So BMW still owns the Triumph brand. Oh my gosh. But they're not making any triumphs. Yeah, well there's so many bean There's cameras. motorcycles. Yeah, there are yeah, yeah, we could do a whole And BMW also makes their own motorcycles, so maybe they're they're kind of using them in that aspect, but we could probably do like we could do a whole obviously we could do a whole show on Triumph motorcycles. That's for sure. Wouldn't that be exciting though, if there you know what I mean, like if there was a resurgence of some of these that you know there's too many bean counters. Everybody, like every automotive manufacturer is just looking at the bottom line as opposed to... You're not going to have what you used to have back in the day. That's the unfortunate thing. If, and if a it teardrop is, just It's going to be a Triumph based on another vehicle, you know, a crossover. So they're going to say, it's a Triumph. We bodied it a little differently or whatever. But I don't know. That would be really cool to have, you know, like the, the Mustang, uh, whatever it was called. The new ones. No, they look like the old ones. Oh, so yeah. Like, their first I back. I the word. Like the, the first time they went back, they hearkened back to the. Yeah, that would be awesome design. to have like a new TR6. Wouldn't yes. that be sweet? Oh, it would be, be fantastic. Cool. Or TR4s and, and stuff. The, the con consumers are ready for it. People will lose their minds. I'm sure it's just a lot of these cars, they can't. Mustangs were always big cars, period. Right. And Yeah. And the newer cars are big. 911s if you look at a 79911 yeah put it up to a 2015 911 the 911s have gotten long and they've gotten fat they're eating a lot or something <laughs> i don't know but i think it's safety and and it, it probably handling helps too but they just they don't look nothing like the earlier 911s oh and, uh, no i don't know all. maybe they would just ruin the tr6 trying to make it come back but maybe it was a long car, but it was skinny. Mm -hmm. It's not wide. So yeah. I don't know. It'd be interesting. Yeah. I did, out of, while we were talking about size, uh, I did, out of curiosity, Google the exact size of the Triumph Spitfire because, like, Chad and I were talking about it. Those are super duper tidy cars. Like, you, I, uh, you need to do a little bit of yoga before you try and get in there. Like, be prepared. But it's not comfortable. No, I think I, I pop my hip out every time trying to get out of it. I think it, so I know I have a photo of me right by it. I honestly feel like it goes to my kneecaps. Let's see. Hold on. Let me find it. Goes to my kneecaps. All right. So the dimensions, height, from the width, height, 48 inches, hood up, width. No, oh, that can't be right. You're just tall enough to go under one of those lifted trucks that you're driving around everywhere <laughs> around here. Oh, my God. Hopefully. No. Hopefully. I tell you what, driving some of the, these, you know, like when I get a, driving the Mini Cooper or what were we driving earlier? Uh, Callie and I were driving a, um, a speedster replica. Yeah. Yeah. It's cars are so big. Like we were saying earlier that driving any of these tiny cars, you're just, you feel like you're about to get smushed like a bug. Yeah. There's really not much. It's almost like being on a motorcycle. All right. So I'm looking at a, a TR6. And the it goes up to my hip, and then I swear the TR7 is like even smaller. Let's see, I know I got a photo of it. Like I honestly, I feel like it just goes right to my, yeah. Oh my god, like below. Holy cow! It just it just barely like a foot above my kneecap. It's crazy. Look at how tiny that is. 
Yeah, little little cars can get down into the. <laughs> oh, it's like a go. It's honestly not too like bad once car. you get in them, but you don't look very cool getting in them or getting out. Nobody would say it's grace. That's for sure. There's no grace involved. Okay. Just just pain, awkward positions, cramping. A lot of that. A lot of that. So I'm excited though. We have a. You said. Uh, why, why do I? It's a TR2. I don't know why I keep forgetting that. Because I think it doesn't have any door handles. So okay, guys, what we have is a Triumph TR2 in the shop, right? TR2, not TR3. Because yeah. it doesn't have an easy way to tell that. Um, or is through the grill and also the TR3 actually had exterior door handles, TR3A or whatever. But I can't wait. I'm gonna make a history video since we're fresh off the history of the Triumph all about it. See if the owner will let me make a little drive video and post it on the Bad Blonde YouTube. Cause you know, I like to do that. All right, I can hear the music. That means Aiden wants us to get off. We've somehow already rolled through an hour. This really, time flies when you're talking about British sports car history. I'll tell you that much guys. All right, we'll see you next Saturday on the Bad Blonde Radio Show. Party on, Wayne. At the end there, I didn't really have anything to talk about. <laughs> I was like, uh. Let's get this done. All right. Thanks for listening. Okay.